well, appreciate the chance to come and talk with you guys. Um, so uh, I think, uh, as you heard from Eric, those of us that have sort of been in the trenches for the last several years uh, have this real uh, uh, shot to the head as to, as, as to how much scale does matter. And, and I, I kind of want to um, talk about how we move this forward a bit, make it a bit more actionable uh, to the improvement uh, of human health, and talk specifically sort of about the role of technology uh, in the process. So uh, as you heard from Eric, scale drives discovery. Um, and obviously, discovery drives opportunity for uh, clinical translations. As we go through some of these large signature projects, uh, that NHGRI has uh, made happen over the last two decades, really, uh, we find more and more of these uh, sort of actionable uh, uh, markers, mutations, what have you, uh, that give opportunity for, for move to the clinic. Uh, and it, it's crucial uh, and uh, that technology uh, be up to speed uh, for this to happen. So technology, uh, as it emerges, uh, underlies both uh, uh, discovery uh, as well as translation uh, for human health. Uh, I think just two little things to point out here. When we talk about technology, uh, we're not talking just about instruments and, and systems uh, that one might buy off the shelf. Uh, this includes the development of infrastructure, methods, applications, software tools, and pipelines uh, that support and go hand in hand uh, with instrumentation. I should also point out that it's absolutely critical to get to the point where we've where we've been able uh, that we've been able to achieve in some of these projects. Um, that it is absolutely essential uh, in terms of uh, robust discovery platforms uh, to uh, run these technologies at production scale uh, to achieve uh, maximum impact. So if you just think about the big questions that have been asked uh, by NHGRI. Uh, at various times over the last 20 years, uh, at points when the technology was completely and totally insufficient uh, to achieve the project goals. It goes back to the Genome Project, which uh, marked its official start in 1989. Uh, I can speak as one of the people who got one of the first grants from what was then NCHGR. Jane Peterson was the program officer. Uh, and we were going to sequence 500 KB. Uh, of human T cell receptors. Uh, and I can remember just sitting in the, the reverse site visit uh, and them asking us, are you really going to be able to sequence 500 KB? And we kind of said, gulp. We think so. Uh, but we clearly didn't uh, have the technology when we started. Um, but we've made things happen. And in all of these other projects that I have listed, ENCODE, 1,000 Genomes, the Cancer Genome Atlas that you just heard Eric talk a little bit about, the Microbiome Project, you know, these are, these are projects, they were big ideas. We asked tough questions that were going to be important to healthcare uh, when they got started. When we started TCGA and had initial discussions in 2005, the state of the art was PCR and Sanger sequencing. Now we start to think about projects, as you've just heard Eric uh, mention a bit. What is the genomic basis of disease? What is the genomic basis of physiology? And how will we start to address these as well as uh, clinical translation? And, and Richard will talk a little bit about uh, clinical translation in a few minutes. Well, this slide just represents sort of the current commercial state of the art for large-scale genomics. Uh, recently introduced, of course, was uh, Illumina's new uh, HiSeq instrument. Uh, this is a nice evolutionary uh, advance over the technology that we had uh, previously. Uh, there's probably more headroom in there, but uh, it will come out as, as the market allows. There are additional platforms that are or aren't really available uh, or uh, still have some uh, uh, dirty little secrets. The PAC bio instrument, for example, in our hands, 10 KB reads are pretty commonplace, but the error rate is still a bit too high and the cost is still a bit too high to really operate this uh, in places other than sort of niche applications. So we look forward to, to these platforms sort of continuing to push uh, the state uh, uh, of the art uh, and drive costs down. We'll see how that goes over the next year or so. I wanted to give you a couple of examples, sort of emerging examples, uh, for how technology impacts not only scale, but how it uh, brings new uh, applications uh, to the forefront. Uh, the first place that I want to just touch on is uh, how we might create uh, a, a robust uh, process 
for comprehensive uh, clinical uh, analysis of, of cancer genomes. So we use the term comprehensive uh, in contrast to what you will see at many cancer centers and hospitals around uh, the United States now. Uh, quite often a cancer patient can come through the, the cancer center door uh, and be offered up some sort of genomic-based test. Typically this involves looking at a small number of known cancer genes. Quite often it's just genotyping based. Um, there will be a report. Uh, sometimes there's reimbursement by the patient's insurance. But quite often for many and many, for many, many of these patients, there's just not any sort of actionable result. Uh, and one of the things that we and others have seen as we've started to pilot uh, a very comprehensive suite uh, of analysis that includes whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing, as well as a transcriptome analysis, uh, is starting to yield for many patients uh, actionable results. Uh, as an example here, uh, this is analysis of 17 patients uh, who were seen in St. Louis with lung cancer. Uh, each one of the columns in this matrix uh, is an individual lung cancer patient. We've got 12 smokers over on the left and five non-smokers uh, over on the right. Uh, each row on the left side indicates a gene that's been altered in these patients, and over on the right side of the matrix, a corresponding targeted therapy uh, that could be used once uh, one of these uh, gene alterations has been discovered. The different colored boxes show you the data set uh, that these results were obtained from. Pink are SNVs, red are indels, purple are copy number uh, variations, and then the the green boxes are uh, changes in gene expression that came from the RNA sequencing. The striking thing, obviously, is that every one of these patients has at least one actionable result. Se several patients have many, um, uh, and a physician can then uh, decide to apply one of these targeted therapies. And again, the really striking thing is the number of actionable findings that come from the transcriptome analysis. This is something that is very rarely done uh, at cancer centers in the U.S. I think there are probably only a couple places that are even looking at RNA these days uh, in a CLIA environment. So this is great. This is sort of the holy grail of cancer genomics, right? Uh, you, you sequence a patient. You find a mutation. You've got an associated uh, targeted therapy that you can use. Terrific. But of course, many of these patients are treated uh, and uh, develop subsequently uh, drug resistance disease. Uh, this is sort of a, the next sort of stage of, uh, of where we go uh, with uh, genomics technology. So for example, this is a, a patient uh, who was diagnosed with melanoma, was treated with a BRAF inhibitor uh, uh, successfully, but then uh, several months later his disease relapsed. Uh, the picture here on the right. Uh, and so uh, a biopsy is taken uh, from uh, one of these metastatic tumors uh, from these drug resistance patients. We can perform this comprehensive genome uh, analysis. Uh, we identify through the DNA sequencing tumor specific mutations. And again, it's not really here uh, all about what's driving the tumor, uh, but rather can we use the technology to identify tumor specific. Uh, uh, mutations that might drive uh, immunotherapy. We utilize RNA capture here to identify those mutations that are expressed, uh, and then uh, using T cells that uh, are taken from each of these patients, uh, we can uh, verify candidate uh, immunoepitopes that elicit a uh, response from the patient's own T cells, uh, and then infuse these back into the patients. So there are several uh, clinical trials uh, that are now underway. Uh, with various approaches. The one at WashU uses this dendritic cell uh, vaccine approach where we're basically loading the patient's uh, own T cells uh, with peptides that are generated from this SNV analysis and then infusing these back into the patients. Several patients in St. Louis have already received these vaccines. I want to switch quickly to one other uh, exciting new uh, application. So this is the use of some of these genomics technologies to look at individual cells uh, for sequencing purposes. Um, this is there's a paper that came out uh, in November uh, in Science by McConnell et al., uh, where uh, neurons were isolated from uh, human uh, frontal lobe uh, and uh, essentially uh, sorted out uh, into a dish. And what you're looking at over here is the sequencing results 
from uh, eight individual neurons. Uh, you can see that um, uh, some of them are fairly quiet, but in quite a few others, there's a substantial amount of aneuploidy. These all appear to be relatively normal. Um, uh, and so uh, the question is, is, is how much of, uh, of this is going on? Obviously, this is just uh, uh, eight individual genome projects, if you will. Uh, and then there's a need, obviously, to better understand the ph physiology of the neurons to scale this up substantially. Likewise, a similar uh, approach from the same group, looking at uh, individual fibroblasts. These from an individual with the trisomy 21, you can see that uh, the gain uh, of chromosome 21 shows up in all of the samples that were sequenced here. Uh, some other changes, it's possible to zoom in to sequence uh, base resolution uh, in several of these and find individual uh, uh, SNV variations uh, from cells to cells. Uh, this has now been done uh, by other groups uh, as well, including Avi uh, Regeg, um, who's uh, now up to about 15,000 cells from several other different cell types. Um, this is an uh, exciting and important application uh, of the technology. Um, it's going to drive our understanding uh, not only of, of uh, disease, but also the basic genomics of, of physiology. Uh, we don't yet understand all human cell types. We don't understand the changes that uh, take place in a population. Uh, and so as we can start to apply techniques such as single cell genomics, uh, we can start to get at the heart of the matter. Also in cancer, if you think about the heterogeneity that exists within a single solid tumor, uh, maybe even from the core of the tumor to the outside of the tumor, uh, and how that might affect uh, the way a patient responds to one of these ter targeted therapies, this will be a crucial question to address. So just to, to conclude here, I've given you some examples of emerging technologies that really offer game-changing translational opportunities. Uh, and I think each one of these uh, illustrates uh, the enablement that comes by uh, uh, inexpensive, efficient uh, genome sequencing and analysis uh, that can be performed at very large scale. So I'll pass it to Richard uh, to talk a little bit about clinical translation.